Uh, well, thank you guys for showing up, uh, even those of you who were forced to do so. <laughs> That's okay. So, what I'd like to talk about tonight uh, in our disbelief discourse is why we can't trust our brains. Why we can't trust our brains. Because most of us go through and out life just sort of blindly accepting that what we're seeing, what we're experiencing, what we're thinking is an accurate representation of what's really happening in us. And we know now through decades and decades of research into areas like cognitive psychology and critical thinking that this is far, far from the truth. So our brains are pretty amazing things. Uh, not that they shoot lightning out and things like that regularly. <laughs> out. Anyway. There are electrical impulses, though, that are, are traveling you know, uh, millions and millions of times per second throughout our brain. And so our brain is this amazingly complex thing. There's something like 100 trillion connections between the neurons in our brain. That's more stars than there are in our galaxy. I mean, it is an amazingly, amazingly complex thing. It's also wonderfully resilient in terms of being able to bounce back from injuries, um, being able to learn new information. Even as you age, it turns out old dogs can learn new tricks. You know, just have to shoot them once they get old. <laughs> I've made many mistakes, apparently. Uh, and I'm very sorry to all those dogs. Uh, but it's, it's, it's wonderfully resilient. And wonderfully resilient. But at the same time, despite this complexity, despite this resiliency, our brains, and consequently ourselves, because that's what we are, we are our brains, are very easily fooled. Very easily fooled. And what I'm going to talk to you about tonight is sort of why that is. Um, I'm going to briefly go over about seven ways that we fool ourselves. And these are very broad, broad categories. I'm only going to be talking about three out of these seven categories tonight, because if I talked about all of them, you would be here uh, until approximately the fall. Uh, and I know many of you have jobs or things like that, families that you want to attend to. So I'm just going to talk about three. If you would like to learn about more of them, you can certainly uh, go onto my website, uh, calebblack.com, where I have slides up for my entire course that I teach. Uh, I essentially do a four-week lecture <laughs> on this topic. Um, and so if you guys are interested in that, let me know, and I can certainly uh, give that to you. Right. So things that we have in terms of uh, ways that we fool ourselves can be broadly divided into two separate categories. The first one of these is what I've called problems in thinking. And there are specific kinds of problems in thinking that we see. The first one is what I call scientific problems in thinking. Uh, so you're like, wait a minute, isn't science awesome? Yes, it is. It is awesome and it's fantastic, but there are still problems in scientific thinking that can help us to fool ourselves, and we'll talk about those. Uh, the second category is what we call problems in pseudoscientific thinking. Pseudoscience, of course, are these things that are trying to act like science, trying to dress themselves up as science, but do not actually follow the methods of science. So they're just sort of putting on airs. The third one, and the last one we're really be talking about tonight, uh, is problems in psychological thinking. So ways that our brains have naturally you know, evolved over the course of millions and millions of years to pay attention to certain things and not others, to be fooled. And most of the time this is very adaptive, but sometimes it goes awry. Starting the ones I'm not going to be talking about tonight, because you all want to leave at some point, um, are the logical thinking problems. Uh, there are a great number of books that cover these sort of logical fallacies. I can certainly refer you to some of those if you'd like. And so that's our first category, is these problems in ways of thinking. The second broad category is what I call misperception and misinformation. So I'm misperceiving and I'm misinterpreting three separate classes of things. The first of these classes is random data. It turns out, and again, I'm not going to talk about this tonight, but we are really, really bad at understanding what random is. We can't recognize random when we see it. Uh, incomplete or in non-representative data. Uh, so we get information and don't have the full picture available to us. And then finally, ambiguous and inconsistent beliefs. When things are not clear cut, we're not very good at deciding what they are just based on the data. Instead, we project our beliefs and our experiences onto them in order to see what's going on. 
So, um, our first, so again, we're going to cover three primary areas, three kinds of problems of thinking, and I'll sort of bring it together and explain a little bit maybe about why that is that we're built that way. Okay? So, our first problem in scientific thinking that we're going to talk about, and this is a pretty major one, is that our theory influences our observation. So, in other words, what we see is that how we perceive events is distinctly colored by our thoughts about them. So if I have a theory that I am invested in, scientific theory, and this holds for all other kinds of theories too, but a scientific theory that I'm invested in, that will color how I perceive the information that I'm presented with. It can lead me to very, very different conclusions. So my field is clinical psychology. And so you see somebody that's depressed and you think, okay, well, why are they depressed? And you can get an enormous variety of answers based on the exact same data, purely as a result of your theory. If you're someone like uh, Sigmund Freud, the father of modern talk therapy, you're going to say, well, it's because of these internal conflicts between these unconscious parts of your mind, the id, the ego, and the superego. If you're someone like his arch nemesis, B.F. Skinner, <laughs> then you're going to say, no, it's because there's a lack of proper reinforcement in your environment, you're not getting positively reinforced, uh, you're doing a lot of avoidance behaviors, things like that. And it's going to happen from the exact same thing. This is, to me, one of the problems um, that the public has when scientific information is presented. Well, but this study said that. This study said that. Right. That's okay. Because we, as science, we can accept conflicting information and not be completely wigged out by it. We can say, okay, I don't know what to make of this. You know, your theoretical basis says this is what's going on. Yours says this is what's going on. Well, let's see where the data will lead us. And eventually the data will lead us to a conclusion about which one of these is right. Uh, it's certainly not pointing out that this fellow is right, if anyone's curious. Uh, and then this guy was only partially right. There's a whole lot more going on. And that's what science does. It continues to expand. So this is one of our problems in scientific thinking. One of our other problems that we have is that the observer changes the observed. So the example I often give is, you know, if I wanted to observe the cursing behavior of undergraduates, I would, I would go into the student union. And I would stand up on one of the tables. And I would say, excuse me, everyone. I'm going to be counting your curses. Please just act normally. <laughs> no, that's going to completely skew my data, right? I'm going to have to do a naturalistic observation. They can't know I'm there. But unfortunately, a lot of the times, you do know you're there. So in our psychology experiments, for example, uh, we run you know, hundreds of subjects here a semester. And all those subjects know they're in an experiment. They know they're being observed. And the very fact that they know that they're being observed, or that we, they know that we're studying something, can have an impact on that event. So this can be problematic, then. Because we can't purely rely on things like naturalistic observation, or otherwise we don't have good control over our experiments. But we can't rely purely on experiments, because otherwise we don't have good external validity or ecological validity. So this is a problem with science. So you have to do this sort of balance of a large number of different types of experiments to really get a good understanding, a good idea of what's going on. Even people who start out trying not to interfere with what they're observing often end up doing so. So you guys can probably tell, you know, the picture of Diane Fossey and Jane Goodall, noted for their work with the great apes. You know, they set out to be just observers, and the next thing I knew, they were interacting with these populations. And that happens all the time. That changes the data that you get. Our third problem in scientific thinking is our equipment constructs our results. What we use to study something determines what we learn about. Um, the way that we measure things then impacts how we theorize about things. And one of my favorite examples of this is the telescope. Uh, everyone here has seen a telescope, and most of you have probably looked through a telescope. Chances are you have binoculars that are actually much more powerful than our first telescopes. And so if I'm using something like this, which is a recreation of the original uh, telescope that Galileo Galilei used, or I'm using something like this, which is a large radio telescope, which can see obviously much, much further in across different types of electromagnetic spectrums, that's going to have a huge impact 
on how you're theorizing about things. Just like when, you know, before we had telescopes, we didn't really know what planets and stars were. So these little points of light up there, what's that you think? Ugh. Who knows, right? <laughs> Somebody poked a hole in the, uh, you know, the night sky. Now it turns out those are suns, <laughs> right? And, and our sun is a star. Wait, what? What's going on? You know, they have planets that are, are circling those. We know those now because of the scientific data. Our instruments are able to detect those. Uh, even 15 years ago, we really couldn't say for, for certain there are planets orbiting other stars. Now we know that there are. That's because our equipment's changed. And so that impacts how we theorize. That impacts our science, in other words. So those are all of our problems in scientific thinking. Right? Um, now, obviously, scientists can have a lot of other problems uh, as well, but these are the ones that we see in terms of scientific thinking, ways that we can be fooled in sort of science. So what I'm moving on to now are the problems in pseudoscientific thinking. And our first one of these is anecdotes do not make a science. Stories do not equal evidence, in other words. Um, if this was true, then all sorts of amazingly fantastic things would be true. <laughs> How many of you guys have heard an anecdote before? All right, yes, we all have, right? How many of you have heard an anecdote presented as evidence before? Yes. No, bad. <laughs> bad science right there. That's not, that's not science, right? The plural of anecdote is not data, right? Anecdotes are a place to start our scientific exploration of the topic, not a place to end it. And so when you have someone say, well, I have an uncle who you know, smoked for 70 years and he died while wrestling a bear who had a gun. <laughs> okay, so, you're, so that means smoking is not bad. He probably wouldn't have been able to cure the, kill that bear with his last breath if it hadn't been so rancid from all the smoking. You know, well, that doesn't mean smoking's good for you, right? Uh, my favorite is the it works for me. And this is what you see on all of these pseudoscientific products that are put out there. It worked for me. Right? All the diet things that you see. It worked for me. I lost 48 pounds in three minutes <laughs> with this one amazing secret. Right? Um, you know, and so when people present this sort of information to you, and they're trying to say, well, you know, my uncle did, uh, da, 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 da. Uh, uh, yeah, that's great. Good for him. But for the population as a whole, they're going to die because of this. Right? Um, or, well, you know, I clicked on that internet ad, and it turns out uh, this is two completely different people, obviously. Right? <laughs> but I clicked on it regardless, because she dropped 21% of body fat in just three weeks. Not three weeks, mind you. <laughs> but just three weeks by obeying this one ancient rule. Because nobody was fat in the past. Right? So, obviously. Right. Come on. Right? Uh, there's a reason that things like this uh, induce scorn from skeptics. It's because they're ridiculous. Right? And most people can see things like this are ridiculous, but when a celebrity goes on TV to hawk something like Weight Watchers, oh, credibility. No. Not at all, actually. Um, I was at home at my parents' house, uh, we don't have cable, and so I'm not exposed to, tel or to television commercials very often. Uh, and I was home a couple of summers ago, and this Weight Watchers commercial came on. You know, and, they, and they said on there, go to our website to see the data supporting these results. I thought, I've got you now. <laughs> and so I go on their website, and they've got like this little tiny, almost hidden link that's like this light gray color, right? <laughs> At the bottom right of their page that says, you know, click here if you really want to see the data. And so I clicked on it and had their study that they had run, and it was, it was a fairly well-controlled study. Um, and what it showed was that over the course of about three months, the average person on Weight Watchers, compared to someone who was eating uh, just whatever they wanted to eat, uh, and also exercising, because they tell you they have to do that, right? Um, somebody who was exercising and doing Weight Watchers versus somebody who was exercising and not, uh, the person on Weight Watchers lost an average of three more pounds across three months, which is the equivalent of me taking a really big pee. Right? <laughs> I mean, this is, this is not a clinically significant difference in weight. 
Um, but they're presenting it as there was a difference. Well, yeah, there's a difference. I mean, there's a difference in my height between when I uh, wake up in the morning and when I go to bed because of compression of my spine. But that doesn't mean that people look at me at 9 o'clock and go, wow, your pants look really long. <laughs> you know, so these differences, they don't, they don't mean that this something is necessarily true. Our second problem in pseudoscientific thinking is that scientific language does not make something a science. Uh, and this is what we call pseudo babble. And pseudosciences are notorious for employing this sort of a technique, technique where they'll talk about things like energy fields and frequencies and magnetic waves and blah, 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 blah. But they never actually give you an operational definition of what this means. And that's what we in science do. If I say I'm going to study something, I don't say, I'm going to study kids. <laughs> hey, what, what, what kind of kids? You know, the young ones. The ones that aren't adults. No, I say kids. Well, I'm, I'm studying 8 to 12 year olds in this rural school district. Oh, okay, well now I have an operational definition. But when you have something like uh, this lovely paragraph from crystallinks.com, fantastic site, I recommend you all not visit it. <laughs> Many crystals have healing properties that you can discover. Uh, crystals vibrate at different frequencies to enhance healing. How? Shut up and just read the rest, right? That's what you say. <laughs> Once crystals have excellent healing properties, also has the ability to transform an imbalanced energy field. You guys know what the technical definition of energy is in science? It's the ability to do work. And so if you actually just replace energy with ability to do work, that makes these seem even more ridiculous, which is kind of fun. <laughs> the ability to transform an imbalanced ability to do work field. Now it just sounds silly, right? It sounded pretty good before. But you know, see what it revitalize you, balance your energies. They ionize the water, so therefore they must heal. Really? How about your how about your uh, your hair dryers? Not that I'm familiar with them, <laughs> but hair dryers I've seen them. They're like ionic hair dryers that are supposed to you know do magical things to your hair. Are they healing your hair? Is that what's going on? Maybe do they have crystals in there that are healing your hair? It's worth investigating, and it's a whole new market, right? The healing hair dryer. Um, I may patent that later. Um, so just because you somebody sounds sciency, in no way means they actually are sciency. Our third problem is that just by making a bold statement or a bold claim, that does not make something true. I have long, beautiful, flowing hair. <laughs> right? No, I mean, it does not make that true in any way, shape, or form, except on my face, where it is beautiful and flowing. Um, and other parts of my body that we don't discuss in public. Um, so if you have an extraordinary statement, an extraordinary claim, it requires extraordinary evidence. If I walk in today and I'm late to my talk, or I'm late to one of my classes, and I walk in, you know, disheveled and covered in blood and hair, and I walk in and I say, oh my God, I hit a Yeti on my way into class today. <laughs> I hit it, I didn't know what to do, uh, I tried to peel it off, I didn't know whether to call an ambulance or a vet, I was terribly confused, it died, I just came to class. <laughs> You should all be going, oh my god, let's go see it. Because I should have some pretty extraordinary evidence for that. Now, on the other end, I came in looking the exact same way. Uh, and I said, ah, oh, I hit a deer on the way into class today. I tried to help it. You know, it didn't work. I had to shoot it. All these things. Most people would be like, oh, that's awful. But you wouldn't go, you are a damn liar. Which is what you should say if I said I hit a yeti on the way into class, right? Um, so the more extraordinary your claim is, the bigger amount of proof you have to have to back that up. Uh, and so when people make these sort of crazy extraordinary claims, like L. Ron Hubbard, uh, sort of the founder of Scientology, they you know, well, the reason that we have problems is because there are these uh, dead alien space ghosts that were trapped in a volcano who are now inhabiting your body and you need to pay us large amounts of money to get those things out of you. Wait, really? Where's your evidence? Well, a science fiction writer wrote a book about it. Really, because it sounds suspiciously like science fiction. <laughs> That's just a coincidence. Sure it is. Uh, or if you know someone claims that some sort of magical patch will make you lose weight, 
and it's not a meth patch, then you should be fairly, you know, on edge about that. Hootia. Do you remember, remember Hootia? They don't have this in stores anymore because, you know, people found out it didn't work. Um, but they sold the hell out of this stuff for quite some time. All right? Because it's this um, ancient herb that came from Africa, and Carmen Electra was hawking it, so obviously it works. Yeah, I think before she got in the hoodie, she was probably fine too, right? Because that's her job, is to look pretty. So if it was my job to look pretty, I would not look like this. I would look much better, I'm sure, but that's not my job. My job is to talk. So another problem that we have is that heresy does not equal correctness. Heresy does not equal correctness. And this is something that you'll often hear when people say these sort of outlandish ideas. So, you know, okay, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're laughing at me now. You know, well, they laughed at, and this is the fun part, they laughed at Copernicus when he said that the earth moved around the sun. Right? They laughed at the Wright brothers when they said they would make a heavier than air machine fly, which was roundly considered impossible at the time, by the way. Well, it's true that those people were laughed at for their ideas, but there are other people that are also laughed at. <laughs> and they're called comedians. And they're laughed at because they're funny. <laughs> Not because they have some sort of groundbreaking scientific discovery, um, like how to not actually have a mustache but look like you do have one. Uh, which he doesn't really have a mustache, in case you didn't know that. So, you know, you can laugh at people because their ideas are ridiculous and crazy. Not just because you think that someday they'll be proven right. And this is not to say that science doesn't progress. Right? Science progresses all the time. That's what's so beautiful about it. Because it changes and it grows. It's something that we thought was impossible 150 years ago, uh, how many of you guys have flown recently, in the last year? How many of you have died? Okay, good. Uh, uh, trick question, right? Uh, that's all the empty seats. Um, <laughs> um, too soon? Too soon. Uh, but no, and just because you're saying something that's crazy doesn't mean that it's going to be proven right sometime. Another problem with pseudoscientific thinking is what we as scientists call the burden of proof. And so this is where, you know, if someone makes an outrageous claim, it's not up to me to prove them wrong. If someone makes an outrageous claim, they are responsible for providing the evidence to support that claim. You know, as a scientist, if I say, oh, well, I think that the best treatment for major depressive disorder is my magical fantastic therapy I just made up, and everyone doesn't just go, oh, okay, that sounds great. We'll all do that. Now you say, okay, well, where's your evidence? Right, where's your evidence? Where, the burden of proof is on you making the claim. Um, you know, so when we have people like these Holocaust deniers, for example, um, who say, well, there weren't really all these many millions of Jews that were killed during the Holocaust, but the preponderance of evidence says that there is, they're the ones who should be making these uh, statements and backing them up. If you say that you know, humans and dinosaurs roam the earth at the same time, along with woolly mammals, or woolly mammoths, uh, and wore very nice clothes, very well tailored and dyed. Uh, that's on you to prove that. It's not on me to prove that. Um, this was illustrated to me in one of my classes at a, at a former university where, you know, I had someone in one of my general psychology classes who told me, this is good, I want to prepare yourself, told me that in some cultures, men do the breastfeeding. <laughs> and I looked at her and I said, they do not. <laughs> no, no. In some cultures, they do. I said, no, they don't. They can't. That's like saying, oh, well, that male is carrying a baby today. They just popped it out and sort of switched it back and forth. Wrong plumbing, right? <laughs> And she said, no, they really do. I've, I've read about it somewhere. I said, well, you bring that in. And we will talk about it. And she never showed back up. Um, I mean, if you're going to say something completely insane, like in breastfeed in some cultures, you better have good evidence to back that up, right? Good evidence to back that up. One of our others is what we call rumors do not equal reality. Just because lots of people have said it or heard it, does not mean that it's true. 
Um, one of my favorite websites is out there is Snopes. Um, how many of you guys are familiar with Snopes? Good, good, great site, right? Great site, um, full of fantastic information about you know things that are completely untrue, and yet lots of people say that they are. Um, and so, you know, when you say, "Well, I heard from someone that," okay, well, who's the someone you heard it from? You know, them. Oh, where do they live? Right? What's their address so I can talk to them? Because I'm really curious where they got their information from. So when these rumors come up, you know, uh, well, you know, one time I heard that there was this lady uh, who her poodle was out in the rain, and to dry it off, she put it in the microwave, and it exploded. Which, by the way, if you type in poodle and microwave into Google, this is the closest thing that comes up. Um, I'm not sure what this is, but it looks like a giant microwave to me. Um, you know, completely untrue. A, there's going to have to be a giant microwave to put a poodle in. B, who would do that? And C, would the poodle really explode? We'll test it out later. Um, as soon as I find a giant microwave and a poodle. So if anyone has a spare, contact me after the talk. Um, or, you know, oh, okay, well, there was a government cover-up of these aliens at Roswell. Really? Oh, yeah, yeah. Because this guy who said he was in the army 30 years later said there was. Oh, yeah? Do they have proof that he was in the army? He said he was. Oh, yes. And I am in the Space Marines myself. <laughs> uh, I'm shipping out tomorrow on the Enterprise. Uh, what, you don't believe me? But I said it. Right? Rumors do not equal reality. If something sounds too fantastic to be true, or maybe sounds a little too polished, Chances are some of the details are being left out. Uh, you know, Walt Disney is keeping his frozen body on ice. Maybe you guys have heard that one. Right? Until technology can heal his disease and he can be unfrozen and come back and bring us the greatest cartoons of all time. <laughs> no, Walt Disney is dead and buried in California. Right? Um, so these rumors do not equal reality. Um, Another one that we see, and this is one that I really love, is that the unexplained is not inexplicable. Arthur C. Clarke, who is a um, fantastic science fiction writer, uh, a long time ago stated that technology that's sufficiently advanced and magic are practically indistinguishable from each other. So, for example, this thing. This little device I'm holding in my hands. Um, it can make a red dot appear over there on the wall. That would drive a cat crazy. <laughs> Some of you are itching to go over there, aren't you? Um, how does it do that? Well, I, it does it because I press this button. Right, but why does that happen? You know, how many of you can explain why when I hit this other button, this dims? Right? This appears as if I have magical powers. Some of you who are engineers can explain. Um, I cannot. You know, it might as well be a magical fairy in here who's calling another fairy over there and, and telling the gremlin to hop up and down on the space bar here. Um, I mean, but just because I can't explain that doesn't mean it's not explainable. It is explainable. How many of you guys know exactly what happens when you turn the key in your car? Okay, good, good. Uh, I have questions for you afterwards. Uh, the rest of you do that and then it starts and you're just like, hey! <laughs> And then when it stops, you're just like, I don't know. I, I don't. There's something under the hood? I thought that was just for looks, right? Um, and you, you couldn't explain what it was. And then you go into your mechanics, right? Okay, well, what seems to be the problem? It won't run. Okay, well, what did it do? It didn't run. That's why I'm here. Isn't that obvious? Right? No, I mean, just because you can't explain something in no way means that it's magic. Right? And no way means it's a supernatural, it's the paranormal. Um, a few years ago, I was at a, was at a psychological conference, uh, and there was, there was this fellow talking who was a, a uh, clinical hypnotherapist. Uh, and he was speaking, you know, before me uh, in, the, in the program, sitting there listening to him, trying not to you know, have my brain sort of bleed and ooze out of my ears, uh, until he got to the point talking about how people who were hypnotized were able to withstand enormous amounts of pain. And I've seen videos of surgeries done in India where 
you know, they hypnotized people and they cut them open and they just sat there. It's amazing. And then he started giving his own personal anecdotes, and we know what those are worth at this point, right? Anecdote about, well, I saw this happen myself. Because he said he was attending a fire walking ceremony. That's right, walking on coals, uh, which are not fire, we'll get to that in a minute. Walking on coals, he and his wife, he said that they had self-hypnotized, so they were able to do that with no pain. Uh, and this guy was very animated. He was, I mean, he was a really good speaker, as long as you didn't listen to what he was saying. Um, very animated, and he's talking about, okay, well, you know, uh, what happened is I, I hypnotized myself. And he's like, like, that's how it happens, right? Uh, he's, all of you are hypnotized. Him. Okay, it's okay now. You can wake back up. So yeah, I hypnotized myself. And then I just started walking across there. And he got very animated with his walk, which looked like you know, an embarrassing walk. Uh, but I didn't call him out on that. And he said, well, that, that's why I hypnotized. Then my, my wife, she hypnotized herself. Okay, okay, I get it. That's how you do it, apparently. Uh, I hypnotized myself, or she hypnotized herself, and she started walking through, and then her hypnotism was broken because someone touched her shoulder. And she burned her foot. She was unhypnotized. And I said, hold the phone. <laughs> I've got a problem with that. Yes? No one is asking questions. Yes? I don't know if you're supposed to ask questions or not. <laughs> yes? Yeah. She wasn't hypnotized. It wasn't because she wasn't hypnotized. It's called physics. Well, what, what, what do you mean? Okay, so you're walking along hot coals, right? Yeah, you're not walking along fire, right? Right. What are the coals made of? Uh, I don't know, like char charcoal or something, right? They're not made of metal, right? No, no. Because then you burn, because metal is a good conductor of heat. How many of you guys have ever put your hand into an oven before? And then when you pull it out, it's flaming, right? It's just on fire. No. Is that just me? I apparently have a very bad oven. Will I have to get that fixed? Uh, you put your hand in there, and it doesn't burn because air is a poor conductor. Turns out wood is a poor conductor of heat, too. Especially when you take off your shoes, and then you walk, and these are always done in a grassy field, if you'll notice. You walk in the grass right beforehand, which gives a very thin layer of moisture on the bottom of your foot, and then as long as you walk quickly, that heat doesn't have time to transfer up into your foot and burn you. And so if you're walking and someone touches your shoulder, and you stumble for just a second, <laughs> burn foot. It's not anything to do with physics. I mean, it's, like, <laughs> it's all to do with physics, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's right. This was all this was all lead up to me telling you that I'm actually a wizard. <laughs> and Harry Potter was a documentary. Uh, no, it's, it's, it's nothing to do with magic. It's nothing to do with his hypnosis. It was physics. Pure, simple physics. Um, his presentation sort of went downhill after that. I felt a little bad, but not much. I'm sort of a bastard. <laughs> and that's okay. I'm fine with that. Uh, the pyramids are one of my favorite examples of this. I don't know what how they were made, so therefore... Uh, it was Atlantis, aliens, ghosts. No, it was labor from the Egyptians during the off-season of farming. It wasn't slave labor, by the way. Uh, it, was, it was labor from the Egyptians during their off-season. Um, which is kind of fun. It's more productive than what you know, I do during my off-season. It's in summers, which is sort of sit around, uh, look at nothing, really, try not to speak. But that doesn't mean, just because you can't explain it, that it is not explained. And then we have the fact that what we see, if someone does fail, so for example, an alternative, med um, alternative medicine practitioner fails, a psychic fails, um, you know, someone who's trying to talk to the dead completely flubs it. They rationalize those failures away. They explain them away. And they don't do so in a scientific fashion. So they use things like, well, I'm just not feeling powerful today. My psychic powers are on the wane today. Right? Which is the equivalent of me saying something like, well, I just, my eyes just aren't feeling it today. They're just not seeing very well. When they always see well, right? Or, well, my, you know, my fingers, they're just not being very fingery today. <laughs> I tried to grasp something earlier, they didn't work. They just weren't there. Or, and this is my favorite, is, well, it's not working because you don't believe. <laughs> if you really, truly had psychic powers, 
or if these crystals magically did healing, would it matter if I believed? I mean, when a surgeon goes in and removes your your you know heart or something else like that, and puts something else in there, hopefully another heart, uh, <laughs> it doesn't matter if you do or do not believe that he put a new heart in you. That occurred, right? Uh, if I give you value, it doesn't matter if you're like, this value will not affect me. <laughs> I'm not affected. Right? I'm fat. And now, we can see placebo effects, certainly. And we can see nocebo effects, which are where you expect harm to occur. But reality does not respond to wishes. Our perceptions can be changed. But, you know, when you have these failures, uh, and some of my favorite failures are the, these people that James Randi has exposed. Uh, like this fellow whose name is James Hydra, who was very popular in the early 1980s. Uh, not so much in the fashion circles. Uh, but because of his supposed psychic abilities. He was on numerous television shows until he was essentially debunked by James Randi on live TV. Um, similar to Yuri Geller. Uh, if you're familiar with Yuri Geller, this, you know, Israeli psychic who said he could bend spoons and things like that with his mind. Uh, well, he can as long as they're his spoons that he brought with him and he pre bit. <laughs> yeah. And then, oh, thinking really hard, rubbing really lightly, oh, what well, do you know they bit? But when you bring your own stuff in, he's not so good with it. When you put these things under controlled experimental conditions, they fail. And they do so every time. If they were really there, it wouldn't matter if I believed or not. It would just occur. So, any questions so far? Everybody doing okay so far? Okay. Um, one of the other things that you see with a lot of pseudosciences is, is this after the fact reasoning. And this is very similar to a logical fallacy that's this uh, post hoc ergo propter hoc, which is not just funny sounding words, it's Latin, um, which is kind of funny sounding actually. It means after this, therefore because of this. This is a correlation causation fallacy. Well, I did this, and then that happened. How many of you guys remember head on, head on, head on? <laughs> right, that magical headache relief stuff. You know, you, you put it in there, head on, head on, head on. The greatest commercials, right? And it was like elbow on, elbow on, and knee on, knee on. Um, which neon is actually a real thing, but knee to K on, not so much. Those things, you know, oh, well, I, I rubbed this, what's the equivalent of a giant crayon on my forehead. <laughs> And then my headache went away later. Therefore, it must be the head-on. Yeah? No, 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 no. When do you tend to take headache medicine? When do you tend to take it? When you have a headache. Yeah, when your headache, when you're just beginning, when it's like just a little bit of a headache. Or when you're going, sweet mother of God, <laughs> it's going to explode, I have to do something. That's when you take it, right? You take it when it's feeling the worst. And so just because of regression to the mean, I mean, most people, thankfully, do not have headaches that just continually get worse for their entire lives. <laughs> they get worse, and then they'll naturally go away. And it doesn't matter whether I do head-on, or I do aspirin, or I do bourbon, or whatever. <laughs> it's probably going to go away naturally. So just because something comes after something else doesn't mean it was caused by something. One of my favorite examples of this comes from the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster, uh, which if you're not a Pastafarian, I'd recommend checking it out. Um, this is, a, is plotting our average global temperature versus the approximate number of pirates in the world. And what we see is we see a very strong relationship where when we had many, many pirates, so about 35,000 or so worldwide in the 1820s, uh, our global average temperature, and these are real numbers, in Celsius, okay, that's a measurement too. I was just Fahrenheit. Because you're like, man, it was cold in the 1800s. <laughs> no, 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 this isn't Celsius. It's okay. Uh, it's the only metric thing I'm bringing up today. Just like right here. Um, you know, as our numbers of pirates declined, it turns out that our average global temperature has actually increased. It increased pretty remarkably. Where in 2000, we had approximately 17 pirates left in the world. Um, and these are not software pirates, these are like, yarrr, sort of pirates. <laughs> um, approximately 17 left in the world. We had a very, very high global temperature uh, compared to the past 200 years. 
So therefore, what we need to do to combat global warming is not all this namby pamby hippie liberal nonsense about not driving cars and turning your air conditioner down. We need to become pirates. <laughs> That's what we need to do, right? We all need to uh, grab a parrot, a hook of some kind, and go out here to you know, one of the various man-made lakes in the state, because uh, there aren't any that are natural, various man-made lakes in the state, and do some piracy. Right? And then Oklahoma should probably give you very cool. Right? It'll cool down. Because this is a very strong correlation. And these, these, these numbers are obviously made up, in case you didn't catch that part. Uh, these numbers are made up, but there is a very real correlation between number of pirates on the high seas and global temperature. Now, does that mean one caused the other? Or was it getting so hot that pirates were like, screw this, it is too hot and I have no air conditioning. I am going on land. No, there's something else going on, right? It's called the Industrial Revolution. Once ships started getting faster and being made of things like iron, it was much harder to pirate them. Uh, you know, when you fire your cannon at a ship and it just kind of goes beep, dunk, and they go, oh, shit, you better find a new job, right? Like, this isn't working out very well. Uh, so the Industrial Revolution actually caused both of these. So this is what's known as the third variable problem. There can be something else causing two different things. Right? They don't have to be both related. Um, so one of our other pseudoscientific problems is coincidence. And we are horrible at understanding coincidence. Just as a species, we're really terrible at it. We're really good at some natural kinds of math. Um, so for example, calculus, you know, like I throw this up there. So you're going, no, 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 don't do it. I throw this up there and you're, you can catch it. You, know, you can catch balls and things like that. That's a natural calculus. Some of you can. Some of you just do that one, right? It's okay, you're doing better than most robots do at this point, so you're still winning for another three to four years. Um, I mean, we're very good at some kinds of natural math, but we're really bad at statistics and probability and understanding coincidence. This is really played out in things like uh, gambling, <laughs> the slots, which you don't even have to pull anymore. You just press a button. That's boring and lazy, right? Like, way to go, America. You took the only exercise these people had away. You know, these old ladies had these giant, massive right arms. Toned. Now they've just got a massive finger. So things like you know, understanding that you know, there's nothing that you did magically that caused this machine to spit out coins at you. It would have done so for anyone who was standing there. But you're wearing your lucky shirt, right? You got your little dance you do before you <laughs> press the button. Is that just me? And that might just my dance, apparently. Um, or things like, you know, for those of you who watch sports, uh, the hot hand phenomenon. Oh, he's on a roll, right? He's hot. He's winning. Or they're cold. They're due to, you know, strike any moment now. Those really, really misunderstand basic statistics and probability, and just what coincidence looks like. Um, for those of you who are interested in a sort of further examination of this. There's a really good book by Tom Gilovich called How We Know What Isn't So. Uh, it's really stats heavy, so prepare yourself. Uh, but it's really good because it really explains these coincidences and sort of how we misinterpret them. One of our other problems is representativeness. What we as humans tend to do is we ignore and cherry pick the data around us. So, if I believe in psychics, for example, I'll remember the things that a psychic has told me that's turned out true, and I'll forget those things that are false. And so if I'm looking at something um, like, for example, because all of you were alive here, psychic predictions for the year 2005. So strain your memory back a little bit. Try and remember 2005 and see how many of these things that were printed in the British newspaper, The Sun, uh, fine scientific publication. Um, see how many of these things you remember happening. Romantic drama ahead for Chelsea Clinton. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I can't remember. It's not that important. Every major disease will be cured. Wasn't that awesome when that happened? You guys remember that, right? That was awesome. Uh, terrorists start World War III by shooting a nuclear missile into China. Yeah, that was, that was pretty crazy. That was right before all the diseases were cured. World hunger ends when scientists developed a tasty crossbreed between a camel and an iguana. 
The Camguana, of course, is something we've all partaken of, and I had two of them today. Uh, they were deliciously made up. Communications will be disrupted when Earth's magnetic field reverses. Uh, well, yeah, our magnetic fields actually do reverse you know, every 10,000, 12,000 years or so. I don't think we're due for one for a while, but probably nothing will die. Right? Not that big of a deal. Uh, a California inventor will cause earthquakes in Los Angeles and San Francisco. No, no. NASA astronomers will find a ruined city on Mars. That was cool, right? Uh, that's what that whole new Total Recall movie is about. It was actually shot live on location uh, in Mars. No, wait, it wasn't, was it? No, no, it wasn't. Uh, edible furniture will have to be recalled because of sanitation problem. <laughs> that was pretty rough, right? We were all sitting on our edible furniture, taking a bite of that with some camp guana, you know, talking about how we don't have diseases anymore, and the next thing you know, they're not clean. Uh, millions of dollars in divorce fees will be saved when these criminal criminals were allowed to play a new computer game where the loser dies in real life. <laughs> this actually did happen, but it was just in Japan. Um, They've got those really crazy games over there on TVs. Uh, there will be a new pope. Uh, oh, oh, wait, there was. So therefore, the psychic was correct. <laughs> Except if you go back and look at their predictions for the past six years before this, every year they predicted there will be a new pope because he was in <laughs> terrible health. <laughs> you know, that's like me saying, uh, there's a chance that a major Hollywood star will do something stupid. <laughs> oh no! Yes, like it's not even a, it's not even a prediction. Right? That will happen just because of sure sheer chance. Um, so those are our pseudoscientific problems, I think. Which brings me to my last group of problems I'm thinking that I'm going to talk about tonight. So you're thinking, yes. There's the psychological problems of thing. And the first one of these is what we call effort inadequacies. Effort inadequacies. Thinking is hard. <laughs> and thinking critically is even harder, it turns out. We are not naturally critical thinkers. We aren't. It hurts my brain to do the thinking. Right? And so we have to practice it, just like we would any other set of skills that we have. Because it's not something that naturally comes to us at all. Right? So we'll put out less effort, we'll save mental effort and energy by taking these shortcuts, things like heuristics. Uh, which a lot of times are okay, but sometimes are completely wrong. Right? So, that's right, that's what you're being. <laughs> They're practicing critical thinking. Uh, my son practiced it a lot. <laughs> Lots of critical thinking going on in that brain. Um, it's really, really hard. So just think about that when you see kids. They're just practicing critical thinking. <laughs> Another psychological problem is, as humans, we love and need certainty, control, and simplicity. We like when there's an easy explanation for things. Oh, cancer is caused by too many orange slices. Oh my god, I knew it. Right? Eggs are bad for you. Right, I know. Wait, they're good. Oh, crap. <laughs> the white part's bad. It is, but the yellow part's good. It is? Or maybe it's the reverse. Who knows, right? Butter's bad. Butter's good. Oil's good. Oil's bad. Motor oil, bad to eat. Vegetable oil, but you can burn it in your car. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> the world is confusing. Like, the world is confusing. You know, and so if we have theories about, you know, why things occur, we tend to like the easy ones, the simple ones. Why did that person cut you off? Because they're an asshole, right? That's, oh, that's what every one of you thinks immediately when you're cut off. You don't think, I wonder if there's some sort of situational variable in that person's life that is causing them to drive like a complete fool. No, you just go, you know, you're honking. And then when you cut someone off, though, what? There's reasons. It's not just because I'm a bad driver reasons, right? But we like these simple, pat explanations for things. So when you say something like, well, why does the sun rise and set? You know, well, because Apollo drives his chariot uh, across the, sun, uh, the sky every day. Easy, peasy, lemon, squeezy. That is fantastically simple. Completely wrong. Does everyone know that the sun does not rise and set? Am I blowing anyone's mind right now? Hopefully you're not just like that. 
<laughs> what? <laughs> the sun does not rise and set. We are the ones moving, right? We are the ones moving. The sun stays still. That's really hard for people to understand. Um, about half of our population doesn't understand that. <laughs> which should make you concerned for the future of our country. <laughs> We've known about this for like 700 years now, right? But, you know, the sun rises and sets, oh, because it doesn't. <laughs> it appears to because of the way that the earth turns, right? So, but that's a much more complicated explanation than, uh, sun moved across the sky. Much easier to understand. We also have problem solving it. Inadequacies. Not just effortful inadequacies, problem-solving inadequacies. Where what we do when we're confronted with a problem is we extraordinarily quickly develop a hypothesis. And this hypothesis is not usually based on all the best information. It's just, oh, no, I got this. I know why this is going on right now. And then what we do is we look for only confirmatory <coughs> evidence. We naturally as humans do not look to disprove our hypothesis. We look to confirm them only. Uh, that guy's a jerk. I know, he just cut me off, right? And he was playing Nickelback. Um, <laughs> must be a jerk. <laughs> sorry for those of you who like Nickelback. Just sorry for you. That's, I was apologizing for my joke. Uh, and then, we don't look for disproving evidence. Well, yeah, but you know, he cut you off because he was, he was trying to avoid a turtle that was in the road. And he's listening to Nickelback because you know, his, his girlfriend really likes it. And despite the fact that he hates it, he's being nice. Oh. No, we look for that confirming evidence. That's what we like. We look for it. And we are extraordinarily slow to change the hypothesis. Even if we're obviously wrong. We know this from a lot of research in uh, social psychology. People hold a belief. You can show them, here, this belief is completely wrong. And they still say, screw you. And I will hold that belief. Uh, this is most recently demonstrated in some really interesting behavioral economics research where people looked at uh, information from the Iraq war about weapons of mass destruction. There weren't any. I hope you guys know that. You never found any. Uh, but the, there are large numbers of people who believe that there were. And even if you show them factual information about that, they will still believe that there were. Because we hold on to these hypotheses, we search for this information. If information is too complex, why does someone get depressed, for example? That is an extraordinarily complex question. But we tend to oversimplify our hypotheses and our solution. Uh, it's because their wife left them. Well, maybe not. Maybe their wife left them uh, because of their depression. Right? And maybe their depression was you know, in part caused by uh, molecular tendency, which was then activated epigenetically by an environmental, you know, happening around them, which resulted in, wait, shut up. <laughs> Their wife left them. That's why they're sad, right? We tend to oversimplify these things to make reality appear simple, because we don't like to think. It's hard. And then if we don't see the right solution, we still because we misunderstand the role of coincidences, attribute things inappropriately. Oh, this happened because of that. Uh, oh, well, here's what's going on. Really? Did you account for all this other information and data? Shut up. This is what's going on, right? And so we're not very good natural problem solvers. And then we have the fact that we are uh, very highly ideologically and this simply means that we all resist paradigm change. This is a, a scientific term that applies to all of us, where there's a radical shift in what we know about the universe. We all resist that. Um, you know, if, if you believe that, you know, this pill is, or this uh, let's see, pill or medical device or whatever is very effective to treat this disease, and then some new studies come out and they show it's not very effective. It's no more effective than a placebo. You're going to say, well, that's just one study. Here's the problems for that. I'm going to ignore that and look at this other evidence that confirms my belief. We see this all the time in these alternative medicines. Acupuncture, for example. We have, at this point, some really fantastic what we call sham acupuncture trials. 
where they do placebo acupuncture. It looks like acupuncture, it feels like acupuncture, no needles are going into your skin, and it works just as well as the real thing when you're just doing sham acupuncture. But the people who are doing acupuncture didn't read that and go, well, hell, time for a career change. <laughs> no, they went, uh, shit. That's what they did. Right there. They said, ah, uh, shut up. <laughs> and then they went back to putting needles in people. Um, and so if you have a paradigm shift where, you know, for thousands of years we thought, well, this is the exact story. This is a literal truth about the world, you know, the Michelangelo painting in the Sistine Chapel, and then you have a more complex theory come out that says, well, this better accounts for the change of species over time and how we have this diversity of life. People resist that, and they're going to resist that. We know that they're going to resist that. And then if there's something that you know, supplants our understanding of evolution, people will resist that too. And that's just how we as humans do. We don't like to be told that something we believe is not accurate. We just don't like it at all. So those are our problems. Those are problems. But those don't tell us why these problems occur. Uh, Michael Shermer, in one of his latest books, uh, it's called The Believing Brain has this quote, and I think it's really interesting. Beliefs come first, explanations for beliefs follow. If you haven't read this book, it's actually pretty fascinating. Um, because what we seem to have, uh, and he's attributing this to two things that he has named, and other people have talked about this for decades, and he just sort of putting names on them, are these two evolutionary forces that have shaped our brains. One is called patternicity, and one is called agenticity. Patternicity is very simply, our tendency as a human being to find patterns, meaningful patterns, in both meaningful and meaningless data. Meaning we see patterns when they're really there, and we see patterns when they're not there. And so, you know, if you look at something like this, which is a picture that was taken in the late 70s, where'd it go? <laughs> Son of a ghosts, right? <laughs> I can't explain it, therefore magic. I see this. I see if it comes back up again. Son of a. It's ghosts. No. Uh, my arrow is now useless. Pointing at nothing. Uh, it was a face. It was a face on Mars. How many of you guys are familiar with this? This picture that was taken in the 1970s, it was this face on Mars. People were just in uproar. Oh, this proves there are people on Mars. And apparently they look just like us because they carved a human face on Mars. Or maybe not. Um, and so this patternicity, we'll go back to Mars in just a minute, uh, this patternicity combines with what we call agenticity. And agenticity is this tendency to infuse patterns that we see, meaningful or meaningless, with meaning, intention, and agency. <laughs> so I don't know why this looked like that. Therefore, it was aliens, right? I don't know why my cancer went into remission. Therefore, it's because of my crystals that I had above my bed. I don't know why this happened, therefore there's some sort of magical explanation for it. And what this patternicity and agenticity do is they combine to really cause us to have all of these problems that I talked about. These psychological problems, these pseudoscientific problems, because we look for and seek these patterns and meanings. And we do so in these specific ways that I've outlined. And my favorite examples of these are what we call pareidolia. Um, and so any of you who are familiar, yes, that is Satan playing a guitar. Uh, I guess he's giving the horns to himself. I don't know what's going on. Um, Satan playing a guitar. How many of you guys are familiar with this thing called back masking? Okay. This is where in the late 70s, early 80s, all of these moms who apparently have way too much time on their hands started playing their children's records backwards and then saying that, what? There were satanic messages on these if you played them backwards. Are your children playing them backwards? No. What's the problem then? Well, they can understand it and hear it. No, they can't, it turns out. Our brains are just not able to do that. Uh, and there's some fantastic websites. I'm just going to show a couple of these uh, just so that you can understand this. But again, this pareidolia, what this is, this is simply... I look for something so I find it. 
All right, I look for something so I find it. So, uh, let's see. Let's say uh, Stairway to Heaven. We're all familiar with Stairway to Heaven, Led Zeppelin song. If you play it forward. If there's a hustle in your bedroom, don't be alone there. It's just a spring clean for the main queen. Yes, there are two paths you can go by, but in the long run, there's still time to change the road you're on. That sounds innocent enough. <laughs> that sounds okay. Right, well, until you hear it backwards, and then you hear this. <laughs> now, if I hadn't primed any of you, by saying things like devil worshiping and Satan, you would have thought that was a bunch of gibberish. As it was, you were primed. And you were primed, you were looking for this. You were looking for this sound. And so here, here's the supposed real lyrics. Oh, here's to my Yes. Yes. And so it's truly only if you are looking for this that you would see that. Did anyone catch all of that on my first play? It's because it's not there. It's not there. If you want to hear what one of these really sounds like, uh, then you listen to things like Weird Al. Um, Weird Al Yankovic, uh, fantastically hilarious fellow. He, in the early, set, early 80s, on one of his uh, songs, he put this in response to these ridiculous allegations of backmasking. <laughs> That's what bat masking really sounds like. So that's what it was like in his song. Now, if you play it backwards, what you hear is. <laughs> because it's delicious, despite the fact that it's not cheese, right? But you only hear those if you're purposefully trying to. You gotta spend a lot of mental effort to, to be able to do that. I mean, how many hours do you think those moms spent turning those things back? We're going, is that Satan? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, they go, ah, oh, it was. Was that a tool shed they said? I think I heard tool shed. Anybody else? Well, yeah, now I'm primed to hear it, so I hear tool shed. Um, and so, what we as humans do is we're not very good at separating naturally the wheat from the shaft. The good from the bad, the sense from the nonsense. Because we're not naturally critical thinkers. We're just not naturally critical thinkers. And the only thing that we've developed that can reliably help us to think critically is the scientific method. And that's what it's designed to do. It's designed to prevent us from fooling ourselves. It's designed to allow us to think critically. Because we're really not very good at it. So hopefully tonight, you guys have come to a little bit more of an understanding of why people believe things that are very odd, without good evidence. Uh, and the reason I don't just come up here and just sort of make fun of things, although I do make fun of things, uh, I, I don't just do that because I believe very strongly in what uh, Barack Spinoza said, which is, I have made a ceaseless effort not to ridicule, not to bewail, not to scorn human actions, but to understand them. So hopefully you guys understand them a little bit more uh, at the end of this, and that's all I got. So I'm happy to take questions, or you can flee like mad. It's up to you. So, thank you.